This is the Brooklyn Brawler, and you're watching another original wrestling documentary. Now, getting back to Chicago. The first big show they ever had here in the amphitheater, when I was with the Assassins, I managed them in the main event, it was a sellout. I went from there to Markov and Poffel, took them to main events, and we won. Then I was with Black Jack Lanza, probably one of the most successful wrestlers I've ever had. I headlined Sox Park. I headlined Soldier's Field. I've headlined almost every amphitheater show they've had. I've headlined Hammond. I was the main event. I was the one that packed them in with my boys. Raymond Lewis Heenan was born in Chicago on November 1st, 1944. His father, Robert Heenan, who was a railroad worker, left his mom when he was less than a year old, so he was raised by his mother and grandmother. He was known at a young age for his wittiness and sense of humor, but according to Heenan, his mother, whom he had always called Millie, was the funniest person he ever met in his life, and looked like a combination of Lucille Ball and Betty Davis. In their neighborhood, there was a professional wrestler named Zach Melkoff who lived down the street. Zach served as a Chicago Park District officer during the day and had a unique routine of working out at the beach with rocks, lifting big ones to stay in shape. To Bobby, a 10-year-old kid at the time, Zach seemed like a huge and formidable figure. With cauliflower ears and a dark town from frequenting the beach, Zach had a rough and tough appearance. One day, Zach approached Bobby's mother and asked if he could take a group of the neighborhood kids to a Marigold wrestling event. Seated in the front row of the bleachers, Bobby was instantly captivated by the spectacle. He recalled seeing a wrestler named Johnny Case, who later became a good friend and a travel companion to Japan. Johnny was also an educator and a president in the Illinois school system and played the role of a heel. The most captivating aspect for Bobby that night was witnessing how Johnny Case would control the crowd. When he asked for silence, the audience made noise, and when he instructed them to speak, they fell silent. Bobby was amazed at how a man could command a crowd and evoke excitement, especially when soaring through the air. Right there, he became hooked. Wrestling became something he felt compelled to pursue, despite having previously harbored dreams of becoming a baseball player and being a huge Cubs fan only living a few miles from Wrigley Field. After Marigold Television went off the air, there wasn't much wrestling that Bobby could recall. At the time, he lived in an apartment hotel which his mother managed. Him and his buddies would enter the lobby and engage in tag team matches, taking bumps on the furniture, creating their own show based on what they had witnessed on television. In 1959, Vince McMahon Sr. commenced running his TV show in Chicago, collaborating with Fred Collar, the local promoter. The show originated from Bridgeport, Connecticut, airing for two hours from midnight on Saturday until 2 a.m. the following morning. In awe, Bobby witnessed the likes of Johnny Valentine, Buddy Rogers, Bearcat Wright, the Kangaroos, and the Graham Brothers. It differed from the wrestling he had watched in 1954 at the Marigold, though still on television and not live, it provided an up-close view of these wrestlers. The fascination persisted. This is what Bobby had inspired to do, yet he remained unsure of how to achieve it. Upon turning 15, the hotel managed by his mother was sold. Moving in with his aunt, who was battling cancer, him and his mother moved to Indianapolis until she underwent surgery and his mother could secure employment. Having been held back twice, Bobby found himself in the 8th grade for the third year, attributing it to poor attendance. He preferred taking the bus downtown, sleeping in the tents in the sports department at the local Marshall Fields, rather than attending school. School held little appeal, as he couldn't fathom the necessity of learning about events like the Boston Tea Party or historical figures like Magellan. He simply wanted to watch wrestling. A year after relocating to Indianapolis, his aunt passed away, but Bobby and his mother chose to remain there. One of Bobby's closest friends was Tom Mathis, a disc jockey affiliated with WIFE Radio in Indianapolis. It was through him that Bobby organized his inaugural wrestling event. This event took place on a Saturday night at St. Rita's Boxing Gym in Indianapolis, with Bobby donning a mask and adopting the persona of the Avenger. At that point, he was not part of the wrestling industry and remained uninformed about the inner workings of the ring. The scheduled match was against Tom, recognized as one of the WIFE good guys. Entering the ring, Bobby delivered a promotional speech 
accompanied by Scott Goodwin, an old friend, acting as their manager. The entourage included a couple of girls, a spectacle reminiscent of Gorgeous George's, attired in a mask, snug wrestling pants, and boots fashioned from old hockey skates minus the blades. He also wore a jacket that resembled a stolen shower curtain from a local hotel. Practice sessions occurred in a spacious ring provided by Champ Cheney, an Indianapolis policeman involved in youth boxing. All proceeds from the concessions were donated to the local boxing program. The venue, though small, accommodated a crowded audience of 50 people, creating an enjoyable atmosphere. The crowd favored Tom, expressing their disdain for Bobby and his entourage. The match consisted of two out of three falls, with Bobby putting Tom over. He retained the mask as the following week, he needed to set up equipment and preferred to keep his identity as the Avenger concealed. Facing financial constraints, Bobby dropped out of school, never completing the 8th grade. He embarked in a series of jobs to support both himself and his mother, including roles as an usher at a theatre, a clerk at a hardware and department store, a milkman, and a car jockey at a Ford dealership. It was during this period he received the call for wrestling. While at the dealership, Bobby held a second job at the Indianapolis Coliseum, serving as a stagehand responsible for setting up shows. Paul Kestis, the wrestling promoter at the Coliseum, arranged cards featuring notable names such as Cowboy Bob Ellis, Dick the Bruiser, Wilbur Snyder, the Shire Brothers, and Ray Stevens. Ray Stevens became a significant influence and close friend during the time. They not only wrestled each other, but also had opportunities for Bobby to manage them. Ray's ability to take a bump and his dynamic in-ring style with flowing blonde hair made him an exciting figure. Bobby also formed a connection with the original Sheik from Detroit. Despite the Sheik's intimidating appearance and fire-throwing antics, he looked out for Bobby. After a few months, Bobby acquainted himself with Russ Leonard, the publisher of Big Time Wrestling magazine. On Tuesday nights, he hitchhiked to the armory where he sold programs from 6 to 7. Subsequently, he assisted wrestlers with their bags, earning a bit of money. Following this, he sold Cokes until 8.30, when the matches began. Bobby stashed his coke tray behind a door, adorned a sweater reading Championship Wrestling, and walked wrestlers to the ring as a second, earning $5 for each appearance. During the matches, he would return, shed the sweater, and resume selling cokes. Post-match, he escorted one wrestler back and brought out the next, forming their routine. At one point, he even washed the Sheik's car for an additional 5 bucks. With a $52 monthly mortgage at the age of 16, Bobby felt a sense of financial freedom. As time progressed, Bobby found himself increasingly involved in the wrestling business. He took on various roles such as setting up the ring at the Coliseum, carrying jackets, and serving as a second around the ring. By the age of 17, he started working spot shows around Indianapolis, eagerly immersing himself into the wrestling world. On January 10, 1965, while working at the Ford dealership, he received a call from Dick the Bruiser instructing him to be at the local television station Channel 4 on Tuesday afternoon for interviews. Though uncertain about the purpose, he was thrilled until the Bruiser referred to him as Bobby, a name borrowed from Buddy Rogers manager Bobby Davis. Despite the mix-up, he followed the Bruiser's instructions. After that, he was no longer known as Ray and would now be known as Bobby Heenan. Upon arrival, he found Bruiser and the tag team known as the Assassins comprised of Joe Tommaso and Guy Mitchell, who wore masks. The Bruiser decided to appoint Bobby as the manager for the Assassins. Bruiser instructed them to be at the Holiday Inn on Highway 31 at 6pm for a trip to Louisville. With no limos or first class service, they embarked on a journey with the Bruiser, Wilbur Snyder, Guy and himself in the car. During the ride, Bruiser and Wilbur engaged in a conversation using Carney language, a code unfamiliar to Bobby at the time. Pondering his purpose for the trip, he counted cows, uncertain about his role as a manager. Upon arrival in Louisville, Bruiser and Wilbur decided to initiate Bobby into the wrestling business. Bruiser handed him a mask, instructing him to put it on and emphasizing the staged nature of the matches. Bobby was warned against revealing the secrets and informed that any breach would result in severe consequences. Let me tell you something, this is professional wrestling. This isn't boxing, this isn't karate, this isn't judo, a street fight or anything else, or a back alley brawl. This is professional wrestling. 
where you use wrestling holds. If you're that stupid and can't get it through your head what a wrestling hold is, maybe I can take a little time out and show you. Now, let me be this simple and make it real easy for you to understand, dummy, and everybody else to understand. In the dressing room, Bobby, now masked, introduced himself to other wrestlers, transitioning from his previous role of carrying jackets. He participated in a match against Moose Cholak and Wilbur Snyder. Moose, a sizable and clumsy opponent, was known for his dangerous presence in the ring. Bobby was given the finishing sequence, a jump onto the apron during the match, and Moose would bring him into the ring to unmask him. Entertaining thoughts of significant earnings, he imagined making $10,000 that night. However, the plan went away as Moose struggled to remove the tightly knotted mask, eventually unmasking Bobby. Bobby leaped out of the ring and encountered a woman from Louisville with a distinctive rural demeanor. In an unexpected turn, the woman, lacking teeth, extinguished her cigar on Bobby's neck. Law enforcement intervened, detaining the woman, while Bobby hastily retreated to the dressing room. Post-incident, Bobby emerged from hiding and swiftly dressed before departing in a car. Arriving in Indianapolis at 2 a.m., he received a meager $5 from the bruiser, reflecting on the tumultuous night. Despite the challenging experiences, Bobby's passion for wrestling intensified. A few weeks later, his dual roles as a car dealership employee and a burgeoning wrestling figure clashed when the dealership boss discovered his wrestling pursuits. The conflict escalated, resulting in him losing his regular job. Undeterred, he expressed his commitment to full-time wrestling to the bruiser, despite the revelation that wrestling income wasn't significantly higher. Embracing the persona of pretty boy Bobby Heenan, inspired by Larry Hennig, Bobby seamlessly transitioned into wrestling. His lack of formal training didn't hinder his ability to perform and take bumps. Nights were spent setting up the ring and engaging in tag matches after the shows, contributing to their unconventional learning process. Bobby's unconventional training continued with friends, including Jim Koontz and Tom Jones. They delved into managing, adopting a distinctive style by reacting passionately to their wrestlers' predicaments. Recognizing his physical limitations as a wrestler, he focused on leveraging his managerial skills, realizing that promoters preferred a dual role for cost efficiency. Reflecting on his initial wrestling match against Calvin Prince Pollens, Bobby candidly shared his struggles with endurance. Despite the challenges, the experience in his hometown was cherished. His career evolved through managing various tag teams and wrestlers, encountering unique opponents like a bear named Teddy. Bobby was also known as the first manager for the National Wrestling Alliance in St. Louis, offering a glimpse into the refined, sophisticated environment that contrasted sharply with the chaotic and boisterous wrestling scenes they were accustomed to. After leaving the WWA, at the suggestion of Wally Carbo, Bobby entered the American Wrestling Association in Minnesota in 1969. He encountered Larry Hennig, known as Pretty Boy, who was already teaming up with Harley Race. Initially adopting the moniker Gorgeous Bobby Heenan, Bobby grew dissatisfied with the common use of Gorgeous in wrestling personas. He assumed the role of manager for the tag team comprising Nick Bockwinkel and Ray the Crippler Stevens guiding them to capture a third AWA World Tag Team Championship. As Bockwinkle and Stevens engaged in a feud with the Crusher and Dick the Bruiser, the latter famously dubbed Heenan as the Weasel. This nickname stuck, and Heenan was henceforth referred to as Weasel by his adversaries throughout his wrestling career. The AWA marked the inception of the initial infamous heel stable, the Heenan Family, featuring Bockwinkle, Bobby Duncombe Jr., and Black Jack Lanza. After two years in the AWA, Bobby returned to Indiana in 1971. However, he left Indianapolis for good in 1974 due to a financial dispute. Recounting an incident at Market Square Arena, where a show headlined by Dick the Bruiser and Sheik drew a crowd of 18,000, Bobby felt shortchanged with a $600 payoff compared to the Sheik's 2,000. This led to his decision to return to the AWA. In 1973, Bobby found himself in Japan with the Destroyer, who refused to remove his mask, a practice he maintained even in his retirement. Bobby spent considerable time with him in Japan, where the Destroyer, fluent in Japanese, became a beloved figure. On January 25, 1975, 
An irate fan discharged a firearm at Heenan in Chicago's International Amphitheater following his interference in one of Bockwinkel's matches. Fortunately, Bobby emerged unscathed, but the incident resulted in injuries to five individuals seated ringside with one person in critical condition. Later in the same year, Bockwinkel secured his initial AWA World Heavyweight Championship, putting an end to the seven-year reign of Vern Gagne, the perennial champion and the AWA promoter. During Bockwinkel's tenure as the AWA champion in 1976, Lanza and Duncombe achieved victory by capturing the AWA World Tag Team Championship. This made Heenan the first manager in history to concurrently oversee both the singles and tag team champions of a major wrestling promotion. Despite Wally Carbo's occasional dishonesty regarding payments, Bobby acknowledged his generosity in helping others. He recounted instances where Wally assisted individuals in financial distress, even if it led to unexpected consequences. One such incident involved Wally being arrested for possessing stolen merchandise after helping a man who offered him a television for $100. Surprisingly, the fans embraced Wally, chanting his name louder than ever at the St. Paul Civic Center. Recalling a journey from Manitoba back to Minneapolis with Wally, Bobby and Ray Stevens found themselves lost. In a humorous twist, Bobby explained to a police officer that they were hitchhiking while waiting for Wally, who had gone into a hotel for directions. After the encounter with the cop, Bobby the Brain Heenan found himself in a tense situation with Wally. Emerging from a hotel, Wally, visibly angered, informed Bobby that he had been fined $200 for an open bottle in the car and picking up hitchhikers. Bobby also recounted the wrestling career of George Gadaski, a referee and a wrestler known for his toughness and dedication to setting up the ring before every show. George's commitment to his task didn't spare him from Vernon Wally's complaints about the budget for maintaining the ring. After George's unfortunate death from a brain tumor, a revelation at his funeral shocked Vernon Wally. George had built a barn using wood Vern had repeatedly bought for the ring, a fact that became apparent only after George's passing. Recalling Wally Carbo's gestures of hospitality, Bobby shared a humorous memory of Wally providing him a room at the Dykeman Hotel with a less than impressive view of the wall. Even years after Wally's passing, Bobby still humorously thanked him for the memorable accommodation. Returning to the AWA in 1974, Bobby managed Nick Bockwinkle and Ray Stevens. While Ray Stevens, Bobby's idol, was known for his talent and carefree lifestyle, Nick Bockwinkle exemplified professionalism, maintaining a consciousness approach to his career. The stark contrast in their approach to wrestling provided an interesting dynamic within the business. As Bobby and Nick Bockwinkle flew from Houston to Minneapolis after working for Texas promoter Paul Bosch, Bobby encountered a strange incident on the plane. Seated in the last row, he noticed a man attempting to open the emergency door. Reacting swiftly, Bobby restrained the man and sought assistance. However, Nick, unfazed, questioned Bobby's actions, playfully addressing him as Sir Robert, due to his knighting by Lord James Blears on the floor of the St. Paul Civic Center. Later, Bobby learned that the man was recently released from a mental institution and was merely searching for the bathroom. Upon landing in Memphis, the pilot expressed gratitude and Bobby humorously requested a free round-trip ticket, receiving two bottles of vodka instead. Nick Bockwinkle, known for his extensive vocabulary, often used complex words that puzzled Bobby and Ray Stevens. Their playful banter included a misunderstanding about the term paradox. Baron Von Raschke teased Nick about being educated beyond his means, highlighting his intellectual prowess. Engaging in some light-hearted ribbing, Bobby joked about Nick's AWA championship belt which was crafted by Denver prison inmates. Teasing Nick about the size of the belt, Bobby suggested it resembled a license plate. The AWA, with its winter town schedule and talent roster, stood out as a major league for Bobby Heenan, a step up from Indianapolis. However, despite the favorable conditions, Bobby decided to leave for Atlanta in 1979 with Black Jack Lanza. Vern struggled to explain Bobby's departure. They concocted a story where Bobby was suspended for a year citing an altercation with AWA President Stanley Blackburn. 
Atlanta, a territory governed by the National Wrestling Alliance, presented a different landscape. NWA champions faced strict regulations, with the board determining title changes, deposits required, and even specific match outcomes. In Atlanta, Bobby managed a version of the Bobby Heenan family, including killer Carl Cox, mass superstar, and the unconventional Dr. Judo, Bill Howard. The wrestling world in Atlanta had its quirks, exemplified by killer Carl Cox's unconventional match against Dick Burdock. Before the bout, Carl playfully inserted a softened Hershey chocolate bar down his trunks. When Murdoch executed a move, Carl, in a comical manner, pulled out a big brown hand from his trunks, leaving the audience with laughter and confusion. In another incident in Rome, Georgia, during a tag match with Heenan, Cox disappeared mid-match, leaving Bobby to fend for himself. When Cox returned, he had three feet of toilet paper hanging from his trunks, distracting the audience as he indulged in a hot dog at the concession stand. This unorthodox behavior continued as Cox, dubbed the Macon champion, repeatedly discarded his championship belt, expressing his disinterest in holding the title. Cox's strange sense of humor extended to his use of a glass eye. In restaurants, he would drop the glass eye into his soup and beckon the waitress with one eye shut, creating a surprising and amusing spectacle. Additionally, Cox enjoyed teasing young Japanese wrestlers in the locker room, pretending to lose his glass eye among his belongings only to reveal it between his cheeks as a playful prank. Bobby Heenan found himself in a nerve-wracking situation while suspended in a cage above the ring during Cox's match against Bob Armstrong in Atlanta. Uncomfortable with heights, Bobby faced the additional challenge of throwing powder to Cox while clad in black attire. Despite the tense moments, the unique and unpredictable nature of wrestling in Atlanta kept the audience engaged. Bobby also shared his experience working with renowned announcer Gordon Soley in Atlanta. Soley, known for his deep knowledge of wrestling and memorable catchphrases, commanded respect within the industry. A memorable incident involving Soley getting involved in a storyline led to his temporary dismissal, showcasing the fine line between storytelling and protecting the integrity of the announcers. Heenan reflected on his time in Atlanta. He expressed the challenges of working with Booker Ole Anderson and the less-than-friendly environment. Despite the lack of financial rewards, Bobby stayed for nearly a year before deciding to return to the AWA, marking the end of his Atlanta wrestling chapter. In 1979, Bobby married Cynthia Jean Perrette, whom he stayed married to until his death. In the latter part of 1979, Bobby made a comeback to the AWA and resumed his managerial role with Nick Bockwinkle, leading to a resurgence in championship success, notably against Hulk Hogan in 1983. While on AWA's Japan tour in 83, Bobby suffered a neck injury in a match with Onita, which subsequently limited his in-ring capabilities. In 1984, he departed from the AWA to join the World Wrestling Federation. Unlike many AWA talents who left abruptly, Bobby honored the AWA's requirement of a six-week notice for booking and syndication purposes. Despite claims by most talents that WWF promoter Vince McMahon incentivized them to disregard their notices, Bobby maintained his commitment to the Ganya family, working out his notice in good faith. Short and sweet. Stanley Bradford, the president of the AWA, agreed with me for the past interference or Heenan's conduct, interfering in the matches in the past 10 years. Heenan is through with the AWA. He is definitely suspended. He will not wrestle for the AWA or manage. His departure from AWA was acknowledged on the September 28th broadcast of AWA All-Star Wrestling, where Wally Carbo announced that Bobby had been suspended indefinitely by the AWA president Stanley Blackburn for inciting an attack on the Fabulous Ones by Heenan family members Nick Bonquinkle and Mr. Saito. In 1984, the WWF enlisted Bobby with the initial plan for him to manage Jesse Ventura. Unfortunately, Ventura's retirement, prompted by blood clots in his lungs, thwarted this intended partnership. Consequently, he directed his managerial role to Big John Studd, his close associate from the AWA. Bobby guided John Studd through a feud against Andre the Giant, culminating in a high-stake confrontation at the inaugural WrestleMania. The match featured a unique stipulation, a $15,000 body slam challenge, with the condition that Andre would be forced to retire if he lost. Andre emerged victorious in the encounter, 
not only securing his wrestling future, but also theoretically tossing the bag containing the $15,000 into the crowd. However, Bobby swiftly seized the bag before it could be fully dispersed. Bobby orchestrated the reformation of the Heenan family, a formidable group in the WWF that included a roster spanning Big John Studd, Ken Patera, Paul Orndorff, King Kong Bundy, Andre the Giant, Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard, Ravishing Rick Rude, King Harley Race, The Islanders, Hercules, The Barbarian, Mr. Perfect, The Red Rooster, and The Brooklyn Brawler. Engaging in a heated feud with Hulk Hogan during the 1980s, Bobby took charge of WrestleMania challengers to Hogan's title. Managing King Kong Bundy in a headline bout at WrestleMania 2 in 1986. Leading up to WrestleMania 3, Bobby aligned with Andre the Giant, who challenged Hogan at the event. Although neither secured the title then, Andre defeated Hogan for the championship on the main event on February 5th, 1988, after aligning himself with the million dollar man Ted DiBiase. He occasionally stepped into the wrestling ring during his tenure in the WWF, making his in-ring debut at Madison Square Garden in November 1984. He achieved a clean victory by pinning Salvatore Belomo. In 1984, WWF owner Vince McMahon capitalized on his microphone and comedic skills, leading to Bobby taking on the role of a color commentator, alongside his managerial duties. He stepped into the shoes of Jesse Ventura on Primetime Wrestling and All-American Wrestling, both airing on the USA Networks, forming a dynamic duo with Gorilla Monsoon. He also filled in for Ventura on All-Star Wrestling, a syndicated program that was later replaced by Wrestling Challenge in the fall of 1986. While these shows were originally designed to recap weekly WWF events, viewers were drawn in by the entertaining interactions between Bobby and Gorilla Monsoon. Identifying himself as a broadcast journalist, Bobby took a unique approach by criticizing fan favorites and actively supporting their opponents when they resorted to cheating or underhanded tactics. Bobby humorously referred to the fans as humanoids and often labeled fan favorites, especially those in the enhancement talent category, as ham and eggers. Their on-screen banter frequently saw Heenan launching into extended rants in favor of villainous wrestlers, prompting an exasperated monsoon to interject with classic lines as Will you stop? Give me a break? Or a sarcastic please? In 1993, still grappling with the repercussions of a broken neck he had sustained a decade earlier and finding it challenging to cope with the demanding work hours, Bobby made the decision to part ways with the WWF at the year's end. On the December 6, 1993 edition of Monday Night Raw, broadcast from Westchester County Center in White Plains, New York, Gorilla Monsoon bid Heenan a farewell on air. Frustrated by Heenan's persistent insults, Gorilla Monsoon dramatically ejected him and his belongings from the arena onto the street. Following the show, Heenan revealed that him and Gorilla Monsoon shared an emotional embrace, shedding tears for over an hour at the hotel where they both stayed. Initially intending to retire and spend quality time with his family and relax, Bobby's plan took a turn when WCW reached out to him soon after his departure from the WWF. Initially uncertain, he accepted WCW's offer upon learning of their lighter work schedules and health insurance benefits. He also highlighted the advantageous proximity of WCW's base in Atlanta to his daughter's school in Alabama as a contributing factor to his decision. On January 27, 1994, Bobby ventured into World Championship Wrestling, marking his debut with the promotion. Initially brought in to succeed Jesse Ventura, his former client, Bobby assumed the role of color commentator for WCW Saturday Night. Over time, he not only took over Ventura's position as lead commentator for pay-per-view events, but also assumed commentary duties for the syndicated WCW Worldwide and Clash of Champions events produced for TBS. With the premiere of WCW Monday Nitro in September 1995, he transitioned from Saturday Night to work on the new show full-time. He joined former Chicago Bears defensive lineman Steve McMichael as an analyst alongside play-by-play -play man Eric Bischoff. Subsequently, he was frequently paired with Tony Schiavone, whom in real life he didn't care for. During the January 23, 1996 episode of Clash of Champions and a match between Eddie Guerrero and Brian Pillman, Pillman left the ring and grabbed Bobby, who had a history of neck problems by the caller, forcing him to say, What the are you doing? Live on air. In June 1996, five months later, 
Bobby made a one-off return to ringside at the Great American Bash as the manager of two of his former clients, Ric Flair and Arn Anderson, in a tag team match against broadcast colleague Steve McMichael and then Carolina Panthers linebacker Kevin Green. He also played a crucial role in convincing McMichael to betray his partner, allowing Flair and Anderson to secure the victory. This also filled the vacant spot in the four horsemen that Brian Pillman had left when he departed from the company earlier that year. Starting in late January 2000, WCW replaced Heenan on Monday Nitro and pay-per-view events with Mark Madden. Bobby remained on Thunder alongside Mike Tenay and later Tony Schiavone until Stevie Ray took over in July of 2000. Bobby was then exclusively seen with Scott Hudson on Worldwide until his release by WCW in November 2000. He attributed his uninspired state in WCW to the negative work environment and conflicts with Tony Schiavone. Later that year, after his departure, WCW went out of business. On April 1, 2002, Bobby made a triumphant return to the WWF, providing commentary for the Gimmick Battle Royal match at WrestleMania alongside Mean Gene Okerlund. In January 2002, he revealed he was battling throat cancer. By 2004, the cancer had entered remission, though the treatments led to significant weight loss, resulting in a noticeable transformation in his appearance and voice. Bobby Heenan's initial memoir titled Bobby the Brain Heenan, Wrestling's Bad Boy Tells All, hit the shelves courtesy of Triumph Books on September 1, 2002, featuring a foreword from Hulk Hogan. Following that, a second memoir, Chair Shots and Other Obstacles, Winning Life's Wrestling Matches, was published by Sports Publishing on February 1, 2004, and boasted an introduction by Ric Flair. Steve Anderson co-authored both books. Recognizing his contributions, Bobby was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame as part of the Class of 2004 by Black Jack Lanza. The subsequent night, he participated in a skit at WrestleMania 20 with Gene Okerlund, Mae Young and the Fabulous Moolah. Demonstrating his continued involvement, he had the honor of introducing his protege Paul Orndorff, the Blackjacks and Nick Bockwinkle into the WWE Hall of Fame in the classes of 2005, 2006 and 2007 respectively. His final appearance with WWE, he served as one of the speakers during Mr. McMahon Appreciation Night on the June 11, 2007 episode of Raw. In December 2007, Bobby underwent reconstructive surgery on his jaw following an unsuccessful initial procedure. Placed in a medically induced coma, by the latter half of January 2008, he emerged from the medically induced coma, though he faced a period during which he couldn't speak and had to communicate using his eyes. In December 2009, he was hospitalized after an examination of his reconstructed jaw revealed an infection requiring treatment. Over the last few years of his life, Bobby experienced a series of falls, including breaking a hip and shoulder in a fall that also fractured his pelvis in 2010. In April 2014, he fell out of bed and broke a shoulder, and in May 2016, he fell once again, resulting in a broken hip. On September 17, 2017, surrounded by his family at his residence in Largo, Florida, Bobby passed away at the age of 72. The cause of his death was organ failure stemming from complications related to throat cancer. Bobby is widely regarded as the greatest wrestling manager of all time, with WWE recognizing him at the pinnacle of their 25 greatest managers list in 2007. Mike Mooneyham, a columnist for the Post and Courier, describes Bobby as the blueprint for managers and fellow manager Jim Cornette acknowledges that Heenan shaped his perception of what a manager should be. He earned a substantial six-figure payoff for promoting the Andre the Giant vs. Hulk Hogan match at WrestleMania 3, often hailed as one of the most famous American professional wrestling matches, solidifying his place in managerial history. Jim Ross declares Heenan the greatest talent in the history of the wrestling business. Ross particularly praised Bobby as a color commentator, highlighting his exceptional abilities in the role. That was the story of Bobby the Brain Heenan. The gentle April rain that stained the window panes last night Is all but gone, but lingers 